It is Song Trader Happy Hour. Hello, everyone. I'm Victoria Wilshire. Hello to our audience, and thanks for joining us once again. A uh, couple of things first up. Don't forget to add your questions into the Q&A window on Zoom, as well as on Facebook Live and uh, in the chat window, and we'll get to as many of your questions, questions as we can um, around the 40-minute mark. So let us meet our panelists. Our first guest is a talented producer and audio engineer who calls LA home. His participation in the industry for over a decade has brought him a smorgasbord of sound and music experiences, including creating many a custom stomp style of track for brands such as 3M, Striker Medical, Reinhardt, and more. During his time as a sound editor at Daystar, he was awarded a regional Emmy from the Lone Star chapter of the Emmys for field recording his team as they traveled the country, documenting a NASCAR driver's career. On the live front, he's DJed and mixed front of house arenas. Other collaborations include Adam Lambert, Jonathan Davis of Corn, the Veronicas, and Grammy nominated producer Lauren Christie. We're so pleased to welcome Joe Seth, Joe Crow. Thank you for having me, Victoria. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Oh, great. You're very welcome. Um, and it's going to be Joe, right? You can call me Joe. That's great. Joe Crow. That's it. Joe Crow. I love it. It's a rock star name. Okay. Uh, next up on our panel. This guy is a multi-instrumentalist who makes his way around the piano, bass, guitar, and voice with interchangeable ears. Yes, he's one of those annoying people who could coax music out of a rock. He is also an engineer, producer, and composer with over 25 years experience in the music industry. Whether you've tuned into NBC and caught the Access Hollywood theme, which he composed and produced, or the music of British superstar Robbie Williams, there's a good chance you've heard his work. He has also collaborated with renowned artists such as Gary Barlow from Boyzone, Tony Hadley from Spandau Ballet, gosh, that brings back memories, award-winning production team The Matrix, and screen composer Michael Giacchino. We're very excited to welcome Brandon Christie. Hello, everyone. Great to be here, Victoria. Fantastic. We're very happy to have you both. So, to kick things off, our topic is music placements that break the mould. In other words, in the world of sync licensing, we often think of placements um, as film, TV, games, ads, that kind of thing. But there are many more ways that music can be created as well as used, right? And that's what we're here to discuss. And hopefully by going into these kind of strange and unusual avenues, we can open the minds of our artists and composers and music makers out there who are looking for different ways to um, find value for their music. So. How about we start with you, Joe Crow? Um, how did you get started in the music industry in the first place? So um, I'm from Oklahoma. So when I lived in Oklahoma, towards the end of my college, uh, towards getting the end of my degree, um, which was in government, I kind of uh, veered away and started making music and, and got really obsessed with making beats. And so um, there is a Christian album that I worked on right before I left uh, at Oklahoma and I kind of decided that's what I wanted to do and so um, that was 10 years ago so now been out here and just uh, making music ever since so that's kind of the thing that started it all. So you mean making music not making Christian albums? No <laughs> that was a that was the first the first and the only but um, yeah it was a good experience and it, and it got my feet wet and uh, so yeah here I am so uh, I guess that's it. I, I bet. Cool, and here you are now. And what about you, Brandon? How did it all start for you? Well, long time ago now, in the 90s, I, was, I started touring with various boy bands in the UK and Europe, just as a keyboard player. And, uh, you know, I uh, quickly found out that I didn't have the right look for that. <laughs> uh, so, I, uh, eventually I found myself moving to America. And after that point, I, I took myself more onto the behind the scenes production side of things. And uh, I think that was a good call. Wow, I was going to say, show us your moves. But I'm a keyboard player, there are, no, there are no moves. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that type anyway. Um, okay, so how about our very first unusual music job? Joe, what about you? Um, so, most of the, I guess with the, 
on topic of breaking the mold, the gig that I've gotten most uh, through doing these weird stomp style tracks was kind of um, accidental, I guess you could say. I was in the studio with uh, just an artist and um, some of her friends came in and one of them worked for a, a creative ad agency. And he just was like, hey, you wanna try making one of these beats and we're gonna use them for uh, our client, which basically they would hold these large um, conferences and events for, for corporate seminars and stuff. And um, so he took a chance and said, make this, this beat out of our client sounds and see if we can make like a little video to it. So that was kind of the first, uh, and that was a couple years ago actually. Um, so just kind of a random, it was really dumb luck. Uh, just, you know, meeting people, you know, a lot of it is just meeting people, a lot of people, I think. Yeah, we all need a bit more of dumb luck though, don't we? Um, yeah. So for those out there who don't really, or have never come across stomp style tracks, can you explain that for us a little bit? Yeah, so basically this agency um, pitches out their services to different brands and companies. Um, like one of them was Sonic Drive-Ins and basically uh, the way it works for me with this uh, circumstance is they will, the company will go and film a, the, the place of business, whether it be, you know, a, a drive-in or a Walmart or wherever it is and film all these different sounds. And I'll just take those sounds and basically make a two minute track out of it, just random Foley sounds. So, you know, it may be the sounds of like frying an egg or, you know, fries being fried in a fryer basically turning it into like a two minute song and they make a video to it so that's that's the long and short of it so wow oh, you just bring back memories to me i'm just watching chef i don't know if you've ever seen that movie oh um, yeah i love yeah, chef yeah. i know i love that <laughs> makes me hungry every time um go check yeah. it out guys if you don't know what we're talking about what about you brandon what was your first unusual job uh well i Back when I was living in the UK and I was starting to get into music production, I, there was this uh, basically a cabaret artist called The Singing Chef. And um, he had an act where he'd play guitar and he'd be under a sort of behind a pair of portable hot plates. And he'd sing songs and he'd cook spaghetti all at the same time. And uh, when it came time for him to do his single, um, I managed to get that gig and um he turned up at the studio with the hot plates because uh turns turns out he's he's not comfortable performing unless he can do the whole jumping to the guitar for the guitar riff and then jumping back he's got everything very much in his muscle memory and so he uh i wouldn't let him fire them up though just because of a uh, various health and safety infractions but yeah, that was a pretty weird early one. People want what they want when they're performing. They need what they need. Oh, that's such a shame. I was hoping he was going to be cooking a meal for you at the same time. That's right. Yeah. Um, so in the world of this kind of music placement, is there a way that you're typically asked uh, to start a job, Joe? Um, yeah, so the agency I work with, they they're kind of... Uh, selling this this package deal more or less to their clients um, and clients come to them to sort of throw on these big events so they're the agency I work with is is working closely with those clients so they're I'm, I'm always getting everything filtered through through the agency basically uh, so do you mean that you actually signed up with an agency so they represent you no so it's it's a creative agency and basically they're um, shopping their services out to companies like corporations to to host their their events their yearly um you know what what have you their their seminars and when they lock down the budget with the client they basically sell them a package in which you know one of the elements is a, a custom video using implementing their sounds um and i guess you know these companies get a big kick out of it so i've got it right and so then they will um they will contact you yeah, I'm their go-to for these. Yeah, precisely. I'm kind of their go-to for this uh, when they sell this part of their package, more or less. That's they they hit me up to make it for them. Right, got it. And Brandon, what are you the go-to for? Uh, what? Who? Who <laughs> asks? Who contacts me? I'm the go-to. You know me. I'm multi-talentless, so I can do anything. No, that's not true. 
Oh, come oh, on. Oh, it's false modesty. It's false modesty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we walked right into it, didn't we? Um, but, but how do you usually get contacted for a job, Brandon? Um, it's a, a variety of ways. Sometimes it's a collaborator uh, who will bring you in on something. Sometimes it's a music supervisor. Um, and sometimes uh, it's for odd things, for unusual things. It's often the client themselves. And you end up in a situation often where it's someone who really hasn't commissioned a piece of music before because it's such a, a strange thing and it's, a, it's an idea that's been born out of the left field. And so that's always a challenge. You're often dealing with people that this is their first time doing this. And they sometimes don't know about just some of the practical parts of, uh, of what's involved in commissioning a piece of music and seeing it through. Mm, yeah. That's a good point. Sorry, what was that's, that, Joe? I was saying that's a, that's a good point with, you know, with clients that are not necessarily familiar with the process is making sure everybody's on the right, right page. Okay, well, that's a really good segue, actually. So what happens up front before a job or what should happen to get everyone on the same page, Joe? Um, first of all, I mean, in terms of the project, you need to be very familiar with what the client is expecting um, above anything else. You know, the person who's paying, you need to make sure you know what they are, are hoping to get out of, out of the project. Because sometimes you may have all these ideas as like, as me as a producer, I'll think, Oh man, I'm going to do all these cool things. And it's really, it's not what I want. It's, you know, I'm serving what, what their needs are. So just being familiar with the, you know, project link, um, what the emotion is of it, you know, it's all super, super crucial. Mm, how do you dig into the emotion of the project or the, the brand? Um, for me, with, with my particular circumstance, they, the agency will tell me sort of the demographic of the brand. Or uh, like, for instance, one of them was the North American Carpenters Union, which I, I don't know anything about carpentry or woodwork or anything. And so basically they filled me in on kind of uh, – you know, who, who they represent, like, what is the North American Union, Carpenters Union, who are these people? So I, I took it more of like a, a rock type of direction, right? You know, instead of like some super trappy thing. So just being familiar with, with who you're working for is, saves you a lot of time and stress. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, and so I want to come back to you on that and maybe dig into a few more specifics of exactly what kinds of questions you usually ask to get the most clarity. Um, but Brandon, um, you were smiling on the, the emotion of the Carpenters Union. Um, well, do you have some insight here for us? So about the, what we should... Yeah, should like knowing um, what happens up front before you oh, yeah. get into the job, uh, just to make sure that everyone's on the same page, because I, I think that what we're hearing here is that if you're not on the same page, you can go down a certain path and then it might be, uh, may not be the wrong path, but it may not be what the client's expecting. Yeah. Yeah. I would uh, very much second what Joe said. It's about knowing the scope of the job, the expectations versus the budget. I mean, they need to know, especially if it's an unusual job and they haven't done it for the first time, you don't get a full symphony orchestra for $2,000 <laughs> work for hire. Um, basic things, big band jazz is hard to fake. You really need to get a big band to do that. It's hard to do with just plugins. And, um, and sometimes you need to know if it's even possible because these might be wacky ideas you're talking about. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, if they want a choir of trained squirrels singing underwater, that's gonna be a no can do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I like to be pretty clear um, up front. And then, and also, obviously, there's the financial side of things. I do like to be clear about that up front. So that, uh, and I, I kind of have a, a system uh, for that, which is I like to give people three options. My sister gave me this system. Uh, she's also in the music industry. I like to have like an option to give to the client of the full works, mixed, mastered, all live instruments. And then the kind of the lowest option would be like, all MIDI demo, maybe off using your original piano that you did in MIDI, program drums, and then something in between that's maybe it's some live players, I've mixed and mastered it, you know, maybe the lowest option, they're responsible for going and mixing and mastering it. So it's always good to give people options, I find. 
Yeah, and that's a really good point, actually, Brandon, because I guess as business people, what you're trying to do, as well as being the artist and creating your your product, um, you also want to make sure that you're servicing a client and keeping the job. So, you know, as much as you want to do stuff that fulfills you, it, it is also about earning you, the dollars, right? So, you know, well, how do you actually... Um, apart from having the tears, Brandon, for you, Joe, is it different? Like, how do you not scare people away with your budget? I, first of all, what Brandon said is really brilliant. If you can give them options, you, you, first of all, they feel like you're willing to work with them. They don't feel like, oh, you're just trying to make it, like, you're really trying to give them a, a product they're happy with. For me, um, I have a manager that she, she's incredible. My manager, Maria T. Lyons, she's awesome, but she, she does a lot of my negotiating. You, yeah, thank you, Maria. <laughs> but she's, she is just awesome. And so it's good to have her kind of play bad cop when you need that. Um, and just, I, I always get a, a better rate. I get paid more in a timely manner. Um, so that, and that's what I do. I know not everybody has that, but I would recommend if you're just starting out and you don't have a manager or you don't know where to find one or you're in the Midwest is, and I don't know how ethical people would say this is, but start another email that is your manager's email, you know, say uh, such and such manager at gmail.com and, and it pose as a manager to get yourself um, a better rate. That's what I would recommend if you don't, if, if you're just starting out, but it's just okay. a little tip. So ethics aside, you know, what I like about that idea is that, you know, we're not encouraging people to go and, you know, like steal identities or pose. No, 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 no. No, no, but, no, no. Yeah, but what, what I like about that idea is that uh, it's treating, um, it's taking the business approach. So it's almost putting on a different hat. And as, as artists, as um, producers, as musicians, you kind of have to do that and you have to learn how to disconnect from that artist side, it, which is kind of tough, you know, and you need practice, right? Totally. Totally. How did you get a manager though is my next question. Um, just, you know, when I first moved out to LA, I was just hustling, trying to do any sessions I could, you know, a lot of them were just free. A lot of times nothing came of the songs, just trying to meet anybody I could. And so, you know, just like anything in life, if you if you keep doing it along the way, you know, you find other like minded people. And so I met her almost right as soon as I moved out here and I've been working with her close ever since. She's awesome. She's really awesome. Oh, great. Well, she's got a great plug from you, right? Everyone's <laughs> going to go and look her up and hit her up now. <laughs> um, Brandon, are you self-managed? Yes. Yeah, I've, I've always been lucky enough to uh, to fall on my feet in that regard, but who knows? This but manager sounds secret? quite interesting. What's your secret, though? Being able to stand on your own two feet, do you think? <sighs> Just an amazing dancer. <laughs> no, I, uh, <laughs> I, I've been I've ha I've been fortunate, and you know, a lot of it is just who you meet and who you work with, and collaboration. A lot of stuff comes in through collaboration. Obviously, there's a new world. There's all sorts of ways of getting gigs these days, and it's only going to get more, I think. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to um, switch back to Joe because um, I read something that you wrote where you said you can never ask too many questions mm. of the creative director, and this is when you're working with the, the agency contact, yeah. especially when budget is locked. What does that mean? Yeah. So it's basically it's a lot different whenever you're – because in the world of music, right, let's take a step back. When you're, when I go to a session, when any producer or songwriter goes to a session, it's all in the hopes of like, let's hope we get a great record so that you'll, you know, that the, the song will come out, right? Whereas if you've already gotten commissioned for a piece of work, you're no longer in the trial phase of that gig. You, they, they trust you to do it. So there's no sense of like, oh, I, you know, I'm going to go and kill this. Like, I want to really know what you want out of this work because I want you to be as happy as possible. You know, there's, so you don't have, you, you, you can be really confident in, in saying, Hey, like, give me a, give me references, vibes that you want and, and not being worried that, cause you've already got the gig, you know? Uh, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, and so maybe this is a good time to go to you, Brandon, and talk about some of these other unusual jobs that you've had. 
how do people give you references for, say, you know, the singing chef who has to sing over his hot plate? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, well, I I swear by references. You know, I if I have a tempo and a reference, then that gives me eighty percent of what I need. Obviously, with more unique like music for installations or kind of experiences or unusual things that uh, there's more information required and they'll often, you know, there'll be emails and the, a whole conversation that, go, that goes on there. Yeah, let's expand on that because I think that's quite fascinating. There wouldn't be too many producers or audio people out there who would have designed sound for a major ride at a theme park. Right, so, yeah. What, that... How did that happen? So that's one that a uh, composer that people might have heard of, Michael Giacchino, someone I've worked with. He's worked a lot with Disney and he got commissioned to do the new music for Space Mountain, I think in the early, mid 2000s. That this ride was, was awesome, I loved it. Yeah, and it was, it was a, a very, I mean, I can talk about it now or, or we can get, I don't know what, how you, plan on going into this, but it was a very unique it. situation. <laughs> yeah, it was a unique situation. They really knew what they needed. They had put music on roller coasters before. That's what these people down at, at Disney do. And so we had, we went in with very specific requirements. And one of those requirements is that, of course, your first thought about doing a piece of music is it goes beginning to end. And then you quickly find out that that doesn't work on a roller coaster because if you just press play at the beginning, depending on the weight of the riders, you know, which can be heavy people, light people, every time the ride goes around, it's different. That heavy, a heavier ride will be slow on the way up a hill, faster on the way down. So you can end up with a huge amount of silence at the end of the ride or music just is in the middle. And, and what Michael Giacchino had done was a great string arrangement, a whole arrangement, but the strings were brilliant. They would follow the roller coaster, add it, we go, go, ah, ah, ah. so it would follow. So it had to be really accurate. So what we found out was that they do a, a, they do a system where they um, split it up into several pieces of music that are re-triggered during the ride so that it never goes that far out of sync. Oh. which presents some musical challenges as well. Wow. Yeah, and well, so what happens then is, uh, how is the music triggered? And, you know, sorry if I'm not asking this very well, but because there's multiple parts going at the same time, right? How do you right. ensure so they're getting the same experience at different they, times? I mean, you can't, there is a gray area. Some people will be sitting at the front of the roller coaster car. Some people will be sitting at the back. So there's probably, you have to pick the middle place as the, as the optimal part. But it's actually the car, the roller coaster car itself that triggers it physically, the new piece of music. So the first piece of music would end with a sort of a, a long sustained brass riff, for example, just like that. And then the new part would be triggered, the new piece of music, and that would begin with a drum, a little drum riff. So it'd be, so you'd, so it would appear seamless. You'd just get the, the brass sustaining for however long it needed for the car to reach the trigger point. <laughs> and then it would reach the new trigger point. You'd get the drums go, da -da -ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba, and then you're in. And it, to the rider on the roller coaster, it seems like one seamless piece of music, but you're having the advantage of basically staying in sync with all these little movements that the strings are doing and that you're physically doing. Okay, and then the next question is, um, I want to get back to you as well, Joe. So that this part is, is kind of um, very interesting where um, um, what happens when, um, no, let's go to you. Let's go to you, Joe. Um, I've forgotten that, that question I was going to ask you, but I'll come back to you. Um, what about you? What are some other unusual jobs that you've had? Um. I mean, I was uh, the DJ for a WNBA team, which was <laughs> unusual. I mean, that's not necessarily music placement, I would say, but um, it's it's an unusual audio job. <laughs> and how did that how did that get set up? And and what was unusual when you actually went through with it? Um, just I mean, 
I guess well, a really important thing is learning to work with people. Uh, and in terms of doing that job was a lot of, I mean, I was working with like a team of like 15 people, you know, video people and then a producer on the floor and just, um, I don't know, you, you can get really far in life with not having a lot of skills, but knowing how to communicate. So <laughs> it's maybe that's where I'm at. But, um, you know, it's good to just be able to work on a team, you know, like what Brandon was saying earlier, collaboration is like, it's really the name of the game. And especially with the pandemic, like you've got, you've got to be able to learn to work with people. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. And through all of these panels that we've done, one of the um, key threads that we hear time and time again from people who are working in the industry is that it is all about predominantly if people like working with you. And if they don't, yeah, it doesn't matter how amazing you are. I mean, that will get you to a certain point, right? But, right. you know, again... Well, and, and hard work is, like, expected, right? Like, every, it, everyone expects hard work. So that, that, if that does, you know, you need to be likable. Like, you, people have to like to work with you because no one wants to work with, you know, you know, you just got to be nice. Yeah, you guys seem pretty likable. Maybe that's why it, it um, happens for you. I just remember that question. This is what happens when you get to my age. Um, how did you test the music? Did you have to go on the ride multiple times to test this yeah, thing? Yeah, that's a good, great question. I am. Um, I'm actually terrified of roller coasters, um, <laughs> and I'm reliably informed that Space Mountain is not that scary. And I still wouldn't go on it, but what they had done was they had attached a camera to the front of the car and switched all the lights on, and they made a video for us to score to, which we then cut up into all the sections so that we knew we could work out where all the trigger points were, and we just scored to that video and in multiple Pro Tools sessions so that we could start as each segment could have its own Pro Tools session, but it was the same video in each, in each session. Wow, you could even um, host your own ride, like sell tickets, bring people into your home. I've still got the video. I'm sure I've signed some NDA somewhere that I'm not allowed to release it. It's cool. It's Space Mountain with all the lights on. It's great. Yeah, it is great. I wouldn't be able to do that, though, as a job, because even looking at things like that on video, I feel sick. I'm such a lightweight. Yeah. Um, so, Brandon, how did that differ then to SeaWorld? Didn't you do work for SeaWorld with Shamu? Yeah, yeah, that was an entirely uh, different, unusual gig. Um, I was asked with a composer, Adam Cohen, and a songwriter, Jeannie Lurie, to do music for the Shamu Rocks show. And this was, of course, before the documentary Blackfish, which <laughs> exposed all the animal cruelty. So that it's, it's no longer there. And, uh, but, yeah, I made some money out of that. You and, didn't uh, but, yeah, the soundtrack that... for Blackfish, did you? <laughs> no, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wish we could have got in there. No, they weren't, they weren't close at the time, SeaWorld and the people who made Blackfish. Um, but yeah, no, that was an interesting one because you've got a variety of stakeholders. And um, the one that we forgot was the whales, the orcas themselves. <laughs> and um, we did this very nice song, uh, the sort of light, light rock. Um, it was called Black and White. And uh, we, we found that after a few months, we got contacted. They asked us to remove the beats because the beats were upsetting the principal stakeholder that we'd forgotten about, which was the whales themselves. And then uh, they kept asking us to remove more and more of it. I hope it didn't make them angry um, and cause any of the uh, unfortunate stuff that eventually happened, but I don't think so. But uh, there are always stakeholders that you are going to forget about that, have, that are going to be vital. So that's a, that's a lesson to be learned. And it's never going to be with unusual uh, placements. It's always going to be odd. So you've got to think of everything. Well, maybe they weren't there at the kickoff meeting, which they should have been. <laughs> exactly. You need to walk into the boardroom, a couple of orcas there sitting in Herman <laughs> Miller air on chairs. Yeah. <laughs> Digging into the Evian. Um, so um, that's a really good question that we can lead into now what what are some um experiences that you've had joe where maybe you didn't do enough prep and you dived into the job and then learned the hard way perhaps yeah so with the the particular agency that i work with pretty often now um like the second or third one um track i did for them 
was an, I like added some chords and like added some musical elements to this otherwise like you know just Foley sounds basically and the client just hated it just hated it they're like it sounds like an EDM track that's all these like chords and like this progressive thing and it just and I realized stick to what worked you know and so now when I when I do these I, I get it done in like a day or two and it's because I know exactly what resonates with the editor I know what's going to work with the client because I know now what the agency's prepped the client to expect so now I, I have a very formulaic approach to when I get commissioned for these so it, it is different though like what Brandon's saying is like when you get these oddball clients or gigs it's you know you have all these strange circumstances that you kind of have to have to wade through so getting familiarized with them really helps for sure yeah, yeah I bet um what are some other tough lessons Brandon have you got some for us well I mean, there's always the get your sample rate right <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I've I've worked on a couple of a uh, one very pressured gig I worked on was when we did the new music for Access Hollywood, which wasn't an unusual thing. It was a theme tune, but it had unusual circumstances in that it was they were changing the music. I'm not sure if you think back to um, the horrible days of 9/11, and they were a lot of the media companies were changing their tone. And so their specific was request was a change of tone. They had one of those very happy uh, uh, news entertainment type, you know, like Entertainment Tonight, da, 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 whatever, happy uh, thing, a lot of brass. They didn't want to do that. You know, everyone was thinking, what's the new media environment going to be coming back from this? Everyone was worried about what's David Letterman's first monologue going to be? Will there even be light entertainment ever again? So they came to me looking for a track that had a, a darker tone, more like Fatboy Slim's right here, right now. And that was our starting point for that. By the time we, it aired, and uh, fortunately I kept that gig for 17 years, but by the time it aired, it was nothing like right here, right now. It had become its own thing, but that was the starting point for the, a slightly sort of a more somber tone, sort of a, a cooler sound, and it, it started to change the sound of news entertainment themes. I think Entertainment Tonight is still going with their, with their happy theme though. Are they still around? I have no idea. Those shows are a threatened species, I'm afraid, because of Twitter. <laughs> we need a few more happy themes though, don't we, at the moment? Everything's fairly similar. Yeah. Well, that was the other thing. I noticed very quickly, you know, theme tunes before that used to be 30 seconds long, like the Golden Girls or Cheers, and they play the whole song. Very quickly in the 2000s, it started to become that cold open straight into the show. And then they just give five seconds of theme, um, which I'm not sure if that was just fashion. They wanted to get into the content of the show or it just saved them a lot of money because I know eventually they started paying by the second, whereas it, the PROs used to pay by, uh, it used to have a theme designation that was a single payment. So then everything tightened up in the early 2000s especially after the economic crash and the, yeah wow. so but that was not a weird piece of music but it was a weird circumstance uh, access hollywood and it required some sensitivity in what you're submitting you know you're trying to sort of hit a t very specifically a tone that they're looking for yeah right and how did they explain that tone to you well again i am good with a tempo and a reference track and if they give me Fatboy Slim's right here, right now. They're going to get something that is absolutely legal, but is very much inspired by. <laughs> Which is, the, but, but we worked on it for many weeks after that to get the tone right. By the end, it, it sounded like an entirely different beast. Yeah, right. Which is good. That's a good journey to take. And, you know, to your point about themes getting shorter and shorter, um, I wonder if it's perhaps um, also that there's so much more content out there. The amount that comes out is increasing all the time. We have so much more access. Um, and so we need to grab people's attention much more quickly these days. Right? Yeah. 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 I mean, theme tunes are just designed to bring you in from the other room. You're in the kitchen, you hear the theme tune. Oh, Access Hollywood is on. That's the job it does. Yeah. So, Joe, have you have you seen a change in the way that um, uh, the the brief has changed, perhaps over the last ten years? Um, 
so this particular gig I've been doing for maybe five years or so, four or five years. And um, typically with the agency, they, we, we've worked together on maybe 20 of these. So the, and we're kind of at the point where we know, I know what they, they're looking for and they kind of know what I'm going to deliver. So it's, it's actually gotten easier for me just to, they just hit me up say we need one for like, they, I did one for 3M uh, in January and they just said, we need one for them. Here's the sounds and go to work. So at first it did take a lot of trial and error with them just to make sure it was right and, and right how they wanted it. Um, but over time, it's it's gotten a little bit easier, just out of expectations, knowing what they want. Mm, um, okay, and maybe looking back then, um, how did you differentiate between um, potentially what a creative director was saying to you and what your perception of the brand and what they wanted was? That's a really good question. Um, at first, I don't think I really knew. At first, I kind of just, you know, I, I thought that the the person who hired me was the one that, you know, I just needed to make them happy. Um, and in reality, it was, it, it was coming down the pipeline, you know, through them of what the client wanted. So if I just did a little bit of research or asked the right questions of asking about what is, you know, what kind of people are affiliated with this brand, you know, what type of demographic is it? Then it really helps me to know, okay, I'm going to implement maybe this genre of music into the track or this style or this rhythm, you know, so. Mm, okay. Um, what about you, Brandon? Because I'm sure that you've worked with multiple stakeholders on a job. And what happens if they're saying something different to you? Well, I mean, I look at this work very much as you're the craftsperson as opposed to an artist. You are enacting <laughs> someone else's vision. And yeah. if it's an unusual piece of music, they've often thought a lot about what they want to do. So it's, you know, if I have an idea for sort of a ripping rockabilly guitar solo in the middle of it, and they're not digging that, then that idea is dead. You know, I'm being, <laughs> I'm being hired for my skills. Uh, you don't wanna, uh, you wanna keep your creativity there, but you need to balance your heart and your head because it is someone else's vision you're bringing to life. Mm, like Stephen King said, kill your darlings, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, but what about the case, for instance, where you're dealing with um, an artist and then you're dealing with the label and they're both telling you something different? Have you ever come across something like that? Well, I mean, yes, on the, on the pop side of things, that's, that's it, isn't it? And um, <laughs> you want to... I will try to err on the side of authenticity with an artist because I just think it's so much more powerful, but you know, labels paying the bills. So again, <laughs> it's a balancing job. You've got to be half psychiatrist for this, for this gig. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you agree with that? <laughs> oh, could not agree anymore. It's Brandon nailed it. You have to be a, a bit of a psychiatrist. <laughs> It's not unusual to hear, well, and like um, Brandon was saying, the artist thing is a completely different beast from the placement thing. It's because it's so much spec until the last moment, especially with labels and stuff. You know, you're hoping for the cut, you're hoping for this, and it's like, but with, whereas placements, if you're commissioned, it's just, you approach it very differently, a different mindset of, like what Brandon is saying is, you're, it's not about your creative desires and what you want to make. It's really how to use your skills like a craftsman, like Brandon's saying, to really craft what makes them happy, so. Mm, okay, well, and that's, I guess that's the, one of the underpinning foundational points that we all have to remember when we're getting into the business side of things, even though often, you know, being creative, we just want to run with it, right? Right, yeah. right. Um, okay, how about tips for people who want to break in to do what you guys do? Brandon, do you have some? Yeah, I mean, obviously, this isn't the only thing I presume that Joe, Joe and I do, but um, I would definitely say don't hide away. There's this sort of economic force which is trying to get you to make music on your own with a computer because it's possible, especially if you're a good... A keyboard player who plays a bit of a guitar, a bit of guitar, or vice versa. So, um, 
the trouble with that is you really do end up hiding your light under a bushel and the people, you know, working with teams, it, it's going to be more expensive for you. You may have to spend a bit more of your budget, but the product will be better and you will enjoy it more. And then that team that you work with is going to be the best PR money can buy because they're going to go out there. And, and that's how, you know, you meet a, a Michael Giacchino or whatever you get referred to them. And so that's really important not to hide away thinking you can solve this on your own. Plus it's more fun to work with other people. You get bored with your own guitar licks, don't you? It's, it's fun to work with other talent. Yeah. So don't overly economize. I, it, I'm not saying schmoozing. It's more that you become really good friends with the people you work with. So it's not cynical in any way. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. that's I, I. You nailed it, Brandon. It's I, there's a great when I first started out and I was in college. There's a great like monologue, I guess you could say, that um, Ira Glass from This American Life on NPR. It's like a little two minute monologue he's given, but he basically talks about how when you're creating something at the beginning, it's really important to just do such a high quantity of work and just kind of do as much work as you can work with as many people as you can. And like Brandon's saying over time, you, you just make friends with the people you work with and that you click with and you make a team. And that's like, I think there's a bit of a misnomer nowadays that to be huge, you, you have to be like a Billie Eilish and you have to, you're a one star show, you know, like you, you did it by yourself. And that's rarely how, how it works you know it more often than not you're, you're you're working with your friends and you're creating this stuff so I, I think just exposing yourself to as many people and working with as many people as you can is, is so 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 crucial yeah it, well not exposing in that sense but exposing as in meeting lots of people yeah. <laughs> maybe a flash here there that's it yeah that's, that's how i don't have a manager <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's not the audition process brandon didn't no wow. one tell you that Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Back on track now. Um, so on that outsourcing um, piece of the conversation, what, what's a good way to actually engage others to do parts of the job, Joe? Um, knowing and familiarizing yourself with what you're not good at is a really good strength. Like if you know what you're really crappy at and you're familiar with the process that's needed, you can then outsource it. Like, I'm not a great, um, like, pianist by any means, but I know Brandon, so if, if I need, you know, if I need a, a pianist, hey, I, I can outsource that stuff. So just don't view your weaknesses as something to be ashamed of, but really just um, know how to, to combat it. It's really powerful. Yeah, that's a great tip. Um, Brandon, are you standing in front of your piano right now? No. <laughs> you are, aren't you? Give us a few chords. Go on. What? Like, like, these are all musicians. It's probably like Daniel Barenboim is watching us. I'll play another Who? time. Oh, no. Oh, he's all greatest... shy now, really? I, I, the only things I can play will automatically trigger a copyright infringement from <laughs> Facebook Live. So... <laughs> yeah. But look, trust me, Brandon's great at a party. Um, okay, so how about you, Brandon, for outsourcing? How do you approach it? I mean, I think there's one of the most most important instruments you will ever play is your phone book, uh, even more so these days. Develop your phone book. Um, it's always going to be a short notice that someone wants a didgeridoo player. And you're going to want to know at least someone who knows a didgeridoo player uh, in Los Angeles. So, and especially I think with... Uh, with COVID and Zoom and the progress that the internet's making with musicians communicating. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff the past five years where you, you have to know someone who's not only good, but they can record themselves well in their own space and send you back something via Dropbox or email or WeTransfer. Uh, so so I, I know people that are not only good, but they're good and they can record clean which means not recording in their vocal in their garage. So, um, you know, it's a great time because I kind of think like um, people have become the new plugins again. It's great. We've almost gone back to a, a session type thing. I, I can see that happening because it's pretty cheap, uh, cost effective for someone, for a cellist to go and jump in the studio in their own home for a hundred bucks really quickly for half an hour. And then you get an amazing product if they record well, if they're a great player. 
So developing your phone book so that you don't get find yourself in situations and you're unprepared. Yeah, I, I love that. So yeah, know your know your skills. Go out there and do lots of work. Meet lots of people. Uh, be part psychiatrist. Uh, make sure <laughs> you deliver on time. Know how to record. And um, yeah, sounds yeah. exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And I, we're up to Q and A time. Are you oh. guys ready for some questions? Yeah, sure. That came up pretty quick, didn't it? All right, let's have a look now. This one is from Zoom. This is uh, someone called Wiz Kilo. That's a cool name. Um, what are a few good ways to present yourself to best showcase your body of work? Websites, links. There's a little bit more to this question, so I can break it down after I've gone through it. Um, in my case, it is an 18-year span, but only recently was my music featured on a TV series and not much sync or licensing otherwise. Often hard to meet in person, and now with COVID, relationships are hard to build over cold calls. Okay, so back to the main question. What are a few good ways to present yourself to best showcase your body of work? Well, congratulations, first of all, for the, the placement. That's awesome for whoever got that. That's awesome. For me, uh, and I guess probably maybe a little bit for Brandon, I can't speak for him, but being in Los Angeles, I mean, that, that is a big uh, help just because there are so many creative people that are here. So just being around other creative, that energy, um, it's very easy to network. So it was, I had a tough time in Oklahoma when I, was, when I was making music there. Very tough connecting. Oh, what do you connect on in Oklahoma? And I like Oklahoma. I just, there wasn't, there wasn't that sort of, creative music energy there you know like out in LA you shake a tree and five guitarists will fall out so it's it's a very different landscape I love it you didn't allow me to go there um what about you, what about you Brandon well what I mean <laughs> I'd agree with what I'd agree with what Joe said but I think it is changing I think it is becoming I mean it's great to be in LA like you said musicians are everywhere I do think it is changing I think zoom is changing us um, and compared to six months ago, I know I can be talking to some people and I don't even know where they are in the world and we're discussing a project. And then at the end of the conversation, they say, oh, hi, I'm in, oh, by the way, I'm in Melbourne right now. And, uh, 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 am I the only one saying this? I'm not that I saw it. Yeah. I saw that Melbourne glitched him out. Oh my God. I was going to say, Melbourne is my hometown. Did I do that? <laughs> it's, it's like, oh my God. It's like um, aliens have kind of connected to our Zoom link. Um, all right. Well, while Brandon kind of comes back online. <laughs> I love this. Yeah. You can tell guys we're not in a studio together. This is the the day and like probably the next thing that will happen is like a toddler will come walking in behind brandon right and <laughs> let's move to the next question so um this one's from facebook um elton oh gosh joni g-j-o-n-i i don't know how do you pronounce that what do you think jo jo good good joni it couldn't be good joni right okay sorry elton i i'm trying my best okay I had a question regarding the guest's opinion on the online session industry, remote sessions and productions. How much do you think the online sessions and productions will change the industry? Will it be like, for example, design of marketing where now most pros are hired remotely? What do you think, Joe? Um, I'm not exactly sure as to how people will get hired necessarily, but it, it definitely is changing things. I mean, there's, um, there's now like three records that I've worked with the same musician on that she's an incredible pianist and it, I've never met her. <laughs> and it's, but I keep, you know, we, I, we correspond. I say, we need this, this part. I need this that way or whatnot. And she's incredible. Um, so it, I think it's, it's taken some of the pressure off in the creative aspect, you know, because you don't have to just show up and ex people don't expect to hit within like an hour, you know? So it gives you time to be creative, flush out more ideas. So it's, I think it's taken some of the pressure off to just like show up and 
you know, some people get really anxious in those circumstances. So yeah. it's changed that. I don't know if it's necessarily changed how people are finding gigs or not. I'm, I'm not necessarily sure. Um, but. Yeah, oh, but perhaps the nature of the gigs have changed somewhat, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're all learning a new way of navigating. Um, totally, totally. So, Brandon, that was interesting. You kind of glitched out. I don't know what happened there. I mean, I guess, uh, what are we on? This, this is, we're on Facebook Live and, <laughs> and, and Zoom. Zoom. <laughs> And They'll get it together. They'll get it together. This is everyone's <laughs> lives at the moment. Everyone's yeah. muted. Yeah. Everyone doesn't know they're muted. It's... Yeah. <laughs> You're at home. Your name is Brandon. We are friends. We come in yes. peace. Yeah, it's um, the modern world. <laughs> so I think you were talking about good ways to present yourself to best showcase your body of work. Yeah, did you finish that? I, I, I'm not sure if we got to me on that, but yeah, I mean, I know a lot of composers... Uh, I have multiple areas of my life these days. I know a lot of composers that are, uh, are, will have websites uh, where you can check out all their stuff. And that's, that's the calling card is the website beyond. And that will have all their music, all their bio resume, you know, um, you know, you all know about this. So, uh, but I think that's the, the modern way. And beyond that, it's, I, I'm a big fan of, collaborating with people and, and, and getting your name out there. And then a lot of this, of course, is driven by uh, Spotify these days. You know, if you have a lot of uh, engagement on Spotify, then people are just more interested in you. It's, it's the placement world and the, and, the, and the DSP world, Spotify. They have the, this uh, interconnectedness now where one feeds the other. Yeah, and um, there's all sorts of music on Spotify now. It doesn't have to be a song, song as such, right? So um, actively, actively building up your social presence really helps. Every little bit helps, right? And I, I you know, that whole website thing, I think we can't emphasize that enough uh, because being on the other side of the industry where often we're looking for music to place or we're looking for artists to feature sometimes it's quite hard to actually figure out you might hear a song from an artist but it's hard to actually figure out oh, what are their links they don't have a presence you can't see all of their images in one spot you can't see all of their past work in a very clear um well presented way so uh i i you guys are nodding so i think you're agreeing with me well, I think the client will want to say, we got this guy, go check him out. He's doing this on Spotify. He's got his, his act together with the website. You can hear all his music. It makes them feel better about going to their senior and saying, this is who we're using. It actually also gets a really pro kind of environment and, and landscape around you as um, what you're selling. If you've put more time into shaping your professional um, perspective, then I think people will trust you a lot more as well. So guys, put time into your presence, yeah? Yeah, totally. Right. Okay, so we have another question. So we've got time for a couple more. Oh, actually, should we go back to Brandon on Elton Gajoni? Joni, I don't know if you got a chance to answer that one. Question regarding guest opinion of the online session industry, remote sessions and productions. So basically wanting to know um, about how productions have changed in the industry and is it like marketing where now most pros are hired remotely? What, do you mean how the product is put together in terms I, of virtually? I guess it's the entire shape of it now. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff over the years with with people, I mean, Michael Giacchino is an example. I, in the past 10 years, have met him once. Actually, went to his party. The rest of it is all email, uh, video conferencing. And even in terms of like, uh, I know he, he works with another colleague of mine and they just did strings literally in Australia. I think it, it worked out. The, the string quartet they wanted was in Australia. What was he? The uh, composer John Wood was in London. Michael, I think. Oh, there you go. Oh, is that a koala or a wallaby? Oh, well, I mean, if you just look at the the shape, I guess it's a rabbit. That's a bunny. 
It looks more like a bunny, but I don't think they meant to do a bunny. It's supposed to be a kangaroo. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe they ran out of budget to do uh, proper they couldn't, the, couldn't afford the They get the midi horns. Midi horns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, Brandon, you were saying. Yeah, so, you know, John, uh, who, who was also working with Michael, was in London. Michael Giacchino was in LA. And I think they did a, the sessions, the session was done by Zoom with them giving feedback in real time via video after, after each take. And uh, I think that very much the future. A lot of people are working to solve real time online collaboration. Um, Real-time jamming, that's a huge thing. Obviously, it's restricted by latency and the speed of light, but someone's gonna come along and solve that because you know, if you've all tried singing happy birthday together in a Zoom meeting, you'll realize what a giant mess it is. <laughs> that's latency for you, and it's a, it's a physical limitation that's gonna be very hard to get around. They get around it in video games, interestingly, by predicting any of 20 outcomes of any situation they're pre-buffered so that but you can't do that with live creativity as a singer or a musician so yeah. it's a it's a fascinating world we're, we're going into and and it also opens up more chances for these unusual placements because you can record anywhere these days you can have a little zoom recorder like joe does be recording a, a chip fryer <laughs> and a real read the, the quality of microphones is so great why yep. stick to the studio all the time? So I think people's, the client's creativity will stretch a lot in the future as well. Okay, well, Brandon, maybe you can work on pre-buffering chips for people. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to yeah, be a millionaire possible. overnight. Uh, okay, let's see. We've got time for another one. This one's from Facebook. Chuma, Chu the producer, Wobosi. Hmm. Wow. Um, I constantly hear that you shouldn't do multiple genres and focus on one and not be a jack of all trades. I love lots of genres and produce and write in the ones that bring me joy. What's your opinion of that? That's a tough question. That's tough. Because you, I mean, yeah, stick to, stick to what, what you like, you know, because if you don't like it, it's not going to be good, probably. So you know stick to what you like uh, but and there's some producers out there who can do everything some who can't uh, it's that's a tough question i don't know brandon maybe you have some wisdom yeah i think it's a mixture of nurturing your soul uh, you can't lose your enthusiasm um that's why i'm a big fan of working with people but at the same time there's the practical realities of paying your mortgage paying your rent and you do have a skill set that can that is quite portable. It can be repurposed, but generally, yeah, be authentic, be who you are, because if you're a real hip hop genius, you might not have it for rock and vice versa. Yeah. And so it, it's a complex, it's a complex equation. I mean, we're not all one thing, are we? And we don't all listen to one style of music when we're, when we go home at night or when we're at home at night, every night as we are these days mm -hmm. and all day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it requires self-management to keep yourself nurtured because um, the worst case scenario is you falling out of love with music. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just doing it for the money, right? It's kind yeah. of soul destroying. Yeah, you won't be good at it. You won't stick with it. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, just um, throwing this in there as well, just, you know, the, the whole idea of maybe balancing it a little bit as well, there's probably some merit in that because I know coming through as a musician and a producer as well that um, and a performer that often when I was thrown in to do something that I didn't feel quite comfortable with or I didn't quite connect with, it actually broadened my skills quite a, quite a bit. And then I could go back to what I loved with a fresher perspective, um, probably a better perspective, you know. I know it made me a better singer to sing things that, I just didn't understand, gave you a whole new appreciation for music from the seventies, for instance, you know? So there's that maybe. That's good. Yeah. And no, that's good. You, you yeah. definitely grow by getting out of your comfort zone. I think there's also a, like a, like what you're saying, a balance between if someone asks you to do some genre that, you know, you just like, if someone asked me to make them a country song, I, I gotta be, I, I'm not, no, like I'm not, I don't like, I don't like country music. Like, 
I would be doing them a, a disservice by taking their money and trying to make a record. They'll end up unhappy. I'll do a crappy job. So, you know, but you're right, though. Expanding your boundaries is good. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Worst case scenario, you, you, you'll fail and you'll, yeah. you won't get hired again. I mean, I used to play keyboards for, for two gigs with well-known reggae group, Aswad. And I don't need to tell you that I'm not the right look for a reggae group. And I didn't have the right feel. You know, I play at least 26 milliseconds ahead of the beat at all times. So I, uh, that gig didn't last long. I got the money and yeah, I won't work in reggae again. But, you know. Well, now you know though, right? And now yeah. they know. <laughs> yes, and it made me more interesting. I actually learned how to do the reggae bubble thing on a Hammond organ. So, and then actually I've used that on other tracks, that technique of hey. the two-handed reggae keyboard rig. There you go. So, there you so go. everything feeds into everything. Yeah, there, there you, you go. go. Nothing's wasted, right? Okay. Right. I think we have time for one more. Thank you for all the questions, everyone. These are great. Um, so this yeah, one's from Facebook. Everyone. Simone Hadley Wilson. What was your largest blunder with a client? How did you fix it? And what did you learn? We like blunders because you do learn. That's a good one. Um, one time, I'll go first, Brandon, so you can finish it off. One yeah. time there was this, um, I think he was this Albanian artist when I first moved out to LA and he wanted some like ethnic type drum situation that I just, I did not know what was going on. And, and he was like asking me to make a genre from that. that I, I had no idea what was going on, but I needed the money like Brandon was saying it. And it just was, he hated it. He paid the first deposit of it. And it was just like, you know, he hated it. But thank God that hasn't happened in, in a very, very, very long time. But it was, it was kind of funny looking back on it now. Do you still have that track and look back on it to remember the pain? What track? I don't, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, who are you again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he just blocked it out. Brandon, no blunders from you, I'm sure. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's some pretty technical stuff that I got the wrong sample rate on something. I was doing something at 48K instead of... You've been traumatized, Brandon. This I know, that one really was because it really threw the video out and, and getting it together was like fixing it was three-dimensional chess to me. Oh, no. But... Uh, that was a blunder. I mean, I once recorded the Billy Joel version of New York State of Mind and they wanted the rap version. <laughs> oh. Oops. Yeah. The Alicia Keys version? Yeah, they wanted the Alicia Keys. Totally different song. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that was I'm only all... a day wasted. That's it's, awesome. It's her fault for doing a song by the same name. Exactly. People should just, I think you should, they should, you should be able to use a song title once. <laughs> that one belongs to Billy Joel. <laughs> Gosh, how many songs are there about love? Yeah. Too many. Too many. Yes. Well, look, I think that actually brings us to the end of this session. That was awesome, guys. Thank you so much. You are both very, very clever and talented people. Joe and Brandon, thank you for your time. Um, and also thank you to our audience uh, in here and out there. We hope you found the happy hour valuable and perhaps you might be now inspired to explore new and unexpected ways to get your music out there. You'll be able to view the full session on YouTube tomorrow. Look out for a link in the webinar follow up, email or the post on our social channels and let us know please in the comments what you would like us to talk about on these happy hours. Coming up on the next episode, speaking of music placements, we're doing a little bit more on that one. What goes on in the world of high-end advertising to find the right music to fit a brand or product? Tune in to hear some cool insights into what advertising teams and supervisors look for when tasked with sound tracking an ad. Look out for details. Everyone, please be kind to each other. We'll see you in two weeks for the next happy hour. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone.